So if you have your Bible, let's open up, though, to John chapter 5. Uh, my goal is to be short today for our teaching segment. Um, and then just so you know, the locals here, usually we talk a little bit about afterwards, um, what the verse means to us, if it does mean anything to us. So friends and fam online, feel free to do the same. Uh, John chapter 5, we're going to read nine verses. And um, this is a story about a man that couldn't walk. And he has been paralyzed for 38 years. 38 years. Talk about a bad situation. I, I, I get frustrated with just a couple weeks of pain or, you know, a couple months of discomfort, let alone 38 years. Um, and it's important to recognize that when we jump into the Bible, the most important thing about reading the Bible is not the words in the Bible. It's how you approach reading the Bible. If you think the Bible is just a rule book, don't do this, don't do that, you'll already miss it. If you think the Bible is a place where you can go get points to use on Facebook or, you know, use it to prove your political stand, it's not it at all. The Bible is, uh, it's poetry, it's history, it's, you know, there's letters in there, it's a library of books. And I got to say, as a pastor, I get frustrated when people see the Bible just as this kind of, kind of magical answer book. Well, the Bible says don't have sex before marriage, so don't have sex before marriage. And I don't know, I, I believe the principles in it, but I think there's a little bit more nuance to it. You can't just say, here it is, you're a jerk, because you don't follow this. You know, this book was written, it's a story, and it's something that's about you and I. And so when we read it, it's important we jump into the story itself. Uh, John chapter 5, when you're ready, say, I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> John chapter 5, 9 verses says, after this, interesting thought here, chapter 5, 6, and 7 all start with those same two words, after this, after this. The whole idea is like when God does something, there's always an after this. There's always something to look forward to. There's always something next. It says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there in Jerusalem, there's a sheep gate, a pool in Aramaic. It's called Bethsaida, which has five roofed colonnades. And in this pool lay a multitude of invalids. So these are handicapped people, blind people, lame people, paralyzed people. The Bible says one man was there. He had been invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he had already been there a long time. Don't you love that about God? Like he sees you and he knows how long you've been waiting. You don't have, people walk by you on the street and they only see you for that moment. But when God looks at you, he sees everything before and everything after. He sees the whole story. And it says, Jesus looked at him and knew he'd been there a long time. And he asked him, do you want to be healed? 38 years with no healing. And Jesus has the audacity to start his miracle. Because he's going to heal the guy. We already know what's going to happen. He's gonna, this is going to be a miracle. But he starts with, do you even want to be healed? That's the one thing about paralysis, and we're not talking physical paralysis. Paralysis will have you thinking you're doing better, but you actually don't mind being stuck. This guy said, you've been here 38 years. It's kind of like homeless people. Some homeless people don't want to get off the streets. You know, many of you know the situation with my mom, family watching. My mom, she made it in her heart. She's like, I like living my life this way. This is, I'm on the streets. And I remember saying, you need, there's got to be a change, though. There's got to be a change. And her literal words, every time I try to go back and fix her, or in my mind, I try to say, I can still save her. I just remember those words she wrote me. It says, I don't want to change. And when someone makes up in their mind they don't want to change, there's not, there's not a whole lot you can do. So Jesus looks at this guy and says, do you even want to change? Like, you've been here so long, do you want to be healed? And uh, look what the man says, verse 7. The sick man, I love how the Bible just identifies him. The sick man, the one with the issue. He says, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool. When the water is stirred up, and while I'm going down, another steps up before me. So in other words, there was like this magical pool, and the common belief of the day was an angel would come and stir the pool up. It was very mystical, wasn't really rooted in God, but like they would be like, if, you know, if someone's handicapped, they get in that water, they're healed. It's like the fountain of youth thing. You know what I mean? Jump in and everything's good. So Jesus says, do you want to be healed? And he says, well, yeah, but no one can put me in the pool. So he was focused on the system not realizing Jesus was right there to save him. And Jesus looks at him. He says, sir, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed. He took up his bed and he walked. So I want to pray. And then um, there's three things Jesus is speaking to us about that I think he spoke to this paralyzed man about. 
and then um, we'll open up for discussion. So, Father, thank you again just for this process, just for getting together and singing, speaking, being with each other. Thank you for technology that connects us with friends and fam all over. And uh, we just thank you for what you're going to do today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Um, do, do, do you remember your first job? First job? Yeah, everyone online, you remember your first job? Do you have a job? <laughs> okay, okay, we're waiting for that. Yeah, yeah, looking. Yeah, we'll get you a job. Um, my first job was at the Desert Springs Marriott in Palm Desert, that big old hotel in in there and uh, in there. And um, I got a job as a cashier attendant. And so I would sit in the parking booth. I was 16, and I would get off school about 2:15. I'd jump in my car, go to the Marriott, and I'd work three to 11 was the shift. And I just do my homework in there, and it was just I sat in the parking booth. You know, like at the airport, people come part pay parking and stuff. So I did the cashier thing for like a year and a half, and then I was like, man, I want to park cars. So once I got my license and all that, I became a valet. And then I did valet for a couple of years, and you know, I was partying through high school, and I was smoking weed and, and doing a lot of drugs and stuff. And and then I remember I got my first check, and my boss was like, you know, you could be a supervisor here. And then like six months went by, and I became a drive supervisor. Now I had to wear a suit to work. So I went to men's warehouse or I went to the three suits for $99 place in LA. Don't hate on that. And uh, went and, and got suits and then I became a drive supervisor. I did that for a few months and they were like, you can be a night manager. And so I ended up running the night shift. I ran the whole department at the valet. And, and then I remember, uh, you know, I moved to LA and I took a position in the same company at the Burbank Marriott. And I was living in North Hollywood and I was the assistant account manager at this place. And and everything was great. I was making lots of money. I was buying lots of weed. I was partying a lot. I was like, like everything was great. And I remember having a moment where I was like, man, I don't know if I want to do this forever because what am I just going to do? And I started doing drugs before I would go to work. And it started to get so bland and numb. I'd be like, ah, let me just sniff a little line before I go park cars and stuff. It'll be fine. And then it started to becoming like, okay, I'm going to bring a little sack with me. And as I'm working, I'll just kind of pop in and out, you know, and just get high, like during the stuff. And I remember that continued and then it started getting into like relationships with employees and then it started getting into, you know, ulterior motives for work. And then at one point I remember I had stolen, we, me and the account manager, we had done, we had done a big parking event. We parked like 700 cars, us and our staff, and we did it all by cash. And I remember the first time that I'd stole money. And I remember that night we parked 700 cars, but we only rang up 400 and I took like $3,000 home. And I went and bought some weed or I bought an Xbox 360 when it came out, you know, and then that continued. And I did that a couple times and I realized I was no longer actually living out like who I was because I had gotten stuck in the place that I was at. What was an exciting job as a cashier became this burden like, oh, what am I really doing here? Just making money? What's the point of all this? And I just kind of got paralyzed. I remember I couldn't stop stealing money. Now I was like paying my bills and like I was taking money and stuff. And and eventually, you know, when I left the company, everything I came when I got cancer, I should say, is when I, you know, stopped working for them and all that came out and, you know, I can never work for them again. Um, but all that to say, like, I didn't just become a thief. Like it, it was a slow decline of just being stuck. That eventually now what is what started as something I would never do because I just got stuck. My thinking changed. John chapter five is about a man whose thinking changed. It's about a man who had an issue for 38 years. And what's interesting about this man is the issue was the same the whole time. But the way he dealt with it probably had some ups and downs. And I think when you look at the context of the story, and I'll be very brief today because, you know, we've got family, we're going to hang out. Um, but the context of the story is so important. John chapter 5, imagine this. There's this pool in the middle of the town. And this is known as the magic pool. This is the system. Come to the pool, do the stuff, and you'll get better. Now, replace the pool back then with whatever you want today. You know what I mean? Get a facelift, you'll feel better. You know, start doing drugs, you'll feel better. You know what I mean? Go, you know, online, you'll feel better. Replace the pool with whatever your thing is. We all depend on other things more than we need to sometimes. 
Because this man was surrounded by other invalids, the Bible tells us. They were blind, they were lame, they were paralyzed. So blind, they couldn't see. They weren't, they were, they were blind, they couldn't see. What's, what's the one where you can't speak? Mute. mute. Yeah, so lame, I think, is a term they would have said for mute. They couldn't speak, and there was other people that couldn't move. And while you might be able to speak and walk and move physically, when you read the Bible, there are certain things that I'll feel, and I'll be like, dang, though, I know what it's like to be mute. Like, I know what it's like to want to say something but not know what to say. I know what it's like to be so afraid of something, and I'm like, and nothing comes out. Paralyzed. I know what it's like to steal money from a company and not know what to do and just feel stuck. And so instead of getting help and getting better, you just keep doing it because you're just stuck. That's the tension that Jesus walks into in this moment. Now, this is going to mess up your theology, and then I'll show you the three things he tells them. But the pool... It was a place that a lot of people expected something to happen. They had expectation in the pool. They had false hope in the pool. And I can imagine after 38 years, some of these dudes were depressed because the pool didn't fix their problem. The pool was nice for the community. Everyone knew the pool. It had a lot of tradition. It was cool. Maybe a miracle happened here and there. But like a lot of people depend on miracles to happen. And they don't know how to walk with God through the normal parts of life. So every prayer is like, well, unless God does this, he's not real. Like, unless it goes exactly how I want. And the whole thing about Christianity is God never designed it to go the way we want. He designed it for us to experience who he is and actually become who he meant us to be. And uh, I've always learned that pleasure and duty before Jesus are two different things. What I want to do and what I have to do are two different things. After I met Jesus, they're actually one and of the same. Pleasure and duty is the same thing. And so Jesus walks up and he sees this. And let's just imagine that the man was sitting where Cain was. But there would have been other people that were handicapped and paralyzed all over. Yeah, just waiting. And here's Jesus. He walks by other handicapped people. He walks by other paralyzed people to heal the man with 38 years of an issue. I don't have an answer. I have nothing clever to say here. I I still wonder, like, why didn't Jesus heal everybody? You know, why did he walk by all these other issues just to deal with that one? And I think it's okay to ask those kind of questions. Like, when I read the Bible, I'm not afraid at all to say, like, well, wait a second, Jesus, that's kind of messed up. What about the other guys you walked by? Jesus walks by these guys. He goes to this man, and he says, do you want to be made well? And uh, the man says, yeah, I want to be made well, but no one will put me in the pool. One of my favorite writers, Spurgeon, he says, their eyes were fixed on the water when right before their eyes was a savior. They were all focused on the water. But right in front of them was the dude that could heal everything. And before I give you these three things that he speaks to this this paralyzed man about, I think for our church and, and just for Randy and I, really our lives, we believe that what you think about God is the most important thing about you hands down, you know, whatever your view of God is, and, and there's no, there's, there's, a, there's a right view of God in terms of doctrine, but like, I don't want to be a church that tells people what their relationship with God should be like. Does that make sense? Like, like, I want to be truth. I wanted to show doctrine. And there's certain times where people will say stuff and I'm like, no, dude, that's not in, that's no way. That's not God at all. He wouldn't do that. That's not it. But I think it's important as a church, we realize somebody or some people are going to walk into our church and they're not going to care about any of this Christian stuff. They're going to come in with a problem. And they're going to say, how do I, how do I get pat over this? Mm-hmm. There's going to be other people that are going to come in super churched and they're going to say, this isn't like the last church I went to. There's going to be people that are going to come in and, and they're, everything's going to be great. They've got everything they want. There's going to be people that are going to come in and they just lost a loved one. Someone died. Like there's people, people are going to come in with those problems. And as a church, our job is not going to be to fix those problems. I can't tell you how dumb I felt when someone says, you know, oh, they, they're, you know, they're, they just died. And I'm like, well, they're in a better place now. Like, what a stupid thing to say to somebody who's grieving. Like, there's certain things as a church we want to be very different about. And it's because we want people to, to, to feel like this paralyzed man. We want them to feel like Jesus is speaking to them, not to the overall system. And so there's three things Jesus says to this man. And, and then we'll pray. Um, let's look at that verse. He, he tells him, the guy says, I have no one to, what is it, verse 8, I think? 
where he says, he says, take up your bed. Okay, so there's three things he says in verse 8. We're going to draw something from each one. First thing he says, verse 8 is what? Get up. Number one, first thing Jesus says is get up. I love this because he's unapologetic about like, the guy's like laying there. He's like, I have no one to throw me in the pool. And Jesus goes, get up. Just like, get up. You ever felt like God tell you that? Like, get up. Stop crying. Like, he's consoling and he's nurturing and he's with us. But there's other times where we're complaining about something we've been complaining about for a whole year. And God's going, get up already, man. Get up. Let's go. And it's funny because to this man, he can't get up. But notice Jesus says the thing that the man thinks he can't do. So God will always tell you something that you don't think you can do. Hey, move to Fredonia and start a church. What? <laughs> that's, that's the beauty of living a life of faith is when God says crazy things, we kind of expect it. You know, we, we assume that, like, this is what he does. So he tells him, get up. Second thing he says, pick up your mat, pick up your mat. So he says what? Pick up your mat. What's the mat he's talking about? In those days, invalids would have laid on these mats that would have identified right away with their issue. So if you had a certain kind of mat, if you had a certain colored cloak, that had something to do with your issue. So Bartimaeus, he was a blind guy. He wore a certain color cloak. And when people would see him begging, they would say he's blind. Purple means blind. So you got to go up to him. You can't just throw something at him. So in those days, people walk by and just throw money at people. Well, if he's blind, he's not going to catch it. So there was real practical things in those days. Yeah, there was real practical things in those days to, I to identify who has issues. This is so true that a lot of people struggle with the Old Testament laws just on that thought. People are like, man, the Bible's crazy because, you know, if a woman's on her period, they kick her out of the camp, you know, for seven days. And first of all, two things. Just because the Bible describes something doesn't mean it's prescribing it to us right now. Makes it, descriptions and prescriptions are two different things. A lot of people think just because the Bible described it, the Bible's prescribing it. That make sense? Well, just because the Bible says, you know, we got to stone people, that means the Bible. No. In those days, you gotta, it's a different time. In those days, people, there was two million people living in the wilderness, People were getting sick and dying because women were having their menstrual cycles and they didn't know what to do. Like there was things happening. All those issues, leprosy, all the things the men had to deal with, like they would get kicked out of the camp. It wasn't like discriminatory. It was just like God had to teach them how to live together. It's like, hey, make sure you wash yourself after you touch someone unclean. Because if you don't do that, you're going to get a bacteria. You'll die. The dietary laws, when God's like, don't eat this, don't eat that, a lot of people are like, oh, he's so controlling. No, they were eating stuff out there and they were dying. They would eat something wrong and die. Right. Yeah. So some of it's real practical. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how we got there. Yeah. So he says, get up, take up your mat now. So we can all agree that the mat is what identified him. Okay. I'll never forget the first time we did a riot night. Kids came to the altar. Someone left a weed pipe at the altar. And it was like, you know, we've had, we've had girls give us condoms before. I'm not going to be needing this tonight. Like, we've had kids come up, give us drugs. We've had knives. Like, just at that moment with God, all we would do is say, hey, if you want a moment with God, come to the front. And the first time I saw a weed pipe on the altar, it messed me up. Because what that kid was saying is, and again, not that, you know, weed is of the devil. But again, in his context, he takes the pipe, he puts it on the thing, and he lifts his hands. What he's saying is, I'm no longer identified with this. Maybe I struggle with this. Maybe he's going to smoke again. Maybe he's going to have a problem again. But in that moment, he's saying, this is not going to be bigger than my identity. So when Jesus says, get up, the guy could have got up and ran off and said, look, I'm healed. I'm healed. But he said, take that mat with you because people need to know that no longer identifies you. And then what's the third thing he says? He says, get up, take up your bed and walk. Now he's telling him, put into motion what you just experienced. John chapter five continues and there's some really great stuff in there and I'd encourage everyone watching or everybody here, please finish the chapter when you get a chance. Um, as a church, we're going 21 weeks through the whole book of John. But I think this man, 38 years of an issue, shows us that it doesn't matter what kind of problems people have. When they come to church, anybody can get a healing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe a physical healing. Absolutely, I believe that stuff can happen. Maybe a mental healing that no one will see. Maybe just an emotional healing where they're like, wow, I actually feel good. It's not our job to dictate who gets what. It's our job just to point people to Jesus. 
and he does the rest. And so uh, you've either got to crucify Jesus, you've got to crown him king, but it, he's, he's, he can't just be in the middle. He's not just a cool guy. Either he's God and you believe it, or he's somebody that you're just exploring and you're trying to figure out, like, is this for real? But um, moments like John 5 remind me, it doesn't matter what kind of problem you come with, it doesn't matter how far you are from God. You ever hear people say that? I was far from God. How are you far from somebody who's everywhere at the same time? The, the theological word is omnis, or, uh, omnipresent. He's everywhere. So he's in that fire just as much as he's, in, as he's in the sound of these keys. The voice of God can crackle like that, or it can be perfect like three chords, you know, three notes making a chord. That's the kind of church we want to build, where people get to experience Jesus in their way, how he meets them. And so let's pray, and uh, we'll conclude with some thoughts. Father, thank you that no issue is too hard for you. Thank you that no problem can keep us from you. Like this man, Father, I pray for anybody listening, uh, either live or under the recording, whatever it is, whatever issue they're saying, Jesus, I got no one to throw me in the pool. Would you remind them that you're the ultimate healer today? You're the ultimate way maker. So we love you. <laughs> Thank you for opening our eyes, opening our mouths, moving our lives closer to where you've designed them to be. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. Thanks for everybody watching. Uh, we will see you again next week.